I had been doing writing on Close Encounters before Jaws. So Jaws actually came after I began working on some kind of a conceptual narrative on how to tell a story about UFOs and Watergate and kind of putting that together. Certainly before Watergate, my whole concept was the UFO phenomenon in contemporary America. Then after Watergate, it was, of course, it's going to be a government conspiracy and the UFO phenomenon wrapped into one. What the hell is going on around here? Who the hell are you people? This was ongoing. This was, you know, through the Jaws process and then through post-production on Jaws. It was just a movie I was going to make next. I didn't know if I could get it financed because people were balking at financing it before Jaws. But I had two producers. I had Julia Phillips and Michael Phillips, who were very strong producers. They had produced Taxi Driver, and they had produced The uh, the Sting. They were very supportive of me and pretty much said to me, don't worry, we're going to get the financing for this. Uh, just figure it out. For one thing, I didn't believe it was science fiction. I didn't coin this, but I, I was liberally saying, this isn't science fiction, this is science speculation. Because I had a real deep-rooted belief that we had been visited. And in this century, I was a real sort of UFO devotee in the 1970s and was really into the whole UFO phenomenon from everything I was reading. So it was something for me that was science. This is a flying saucer. That's the one I saw. <laughs> now, I've revised my thinking. As I grew up, I got a little bit older and began to understand that with all the video cameras in the world today, why have UFO sightings diminished? Now, with all those shutters clicking, where is the indisputable photographic evidence? When before the camcorder craze, UFO sightings were flourishing. And so I'm a little more skeptical now than I was in the 70s when I made the picture. But I, I, I really believed it. And so for me, it was about research, reading books on the matter, and eventually meeting my breakthrough partner. When I say breakthrough partner, he didn't write the screenplay with me, but he inspired the title, and that's J. Allen Hynek, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who was the Project Blue Book debunker working for the military as a civilian consultant, going around and looking at all these UFO stories and finding astronomical, natural, logical explanations for what people were perceiving to be extraordinary or extraterrestrial. And he was bringing everything down to a terrestrial level until finally he just couldn't explain about 10% of the sightings. And the 10% of the sightings he couldn't explain were so compelling, the witnesses themselves were so compelling, that he eventually resigned his position to pursue an investigation and a lot of writing on the entire UFO phenomenon. And I called him up and I had read his book and he's the one that shared his title with me, which is why I called the film Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And the Close Encounters of the Third Kind are the most interesting of all. Initially, my producing partners in the studio thought I was crazy because they, they said it has no meaning. What does it mean? Close Encounters of the Third Kind. What does that mean? Close Encounters of the Third Kind is really when you meet them. And so one of my biggest struggles, it turned out, was not getting the film financed because after Jaws, everybody was willing to offer me financing for my next picture. It was getting my title through the marketing department at Columbia Pictures. Have you recently had a close encounter? But I remember when I wrote the script, I kind of wrote it backwards. I started with the landing and then tried to back the rest of the story into how do they get there? And how can we have an operatic third act encounter between them and us? in a beautiful musical way, because the idea of music was just something I thought, well, mathematics is a way of communicating with perhaps another species from off the planet, but, uh, but mathematics is also music. You know, I thought, wouldn't it be great if the math basically is musical math, and they start to communicate with each other through lights, colors, and musical tones. So all this was you know, out of order in my brain, but it found order when I began to write the script from the last scene backwards. I just want to know that it's, it's really happening. I think in casting Close Encounters, what I was really looking for were 
actors who were still closer to their own memories of their own childhoods. Richard Dreyfus was a bigger kid than the children he was raising in his suburban house. Where you can see Pinocchio, which is a lot of furry animals and magic, and you'll have a wonderful time. Monsieur Neri, I envy you. Francois Truffaut, as he was in real life, was a child just of heart. He, he was just as honest as any man I had ever met in the sense that he was in touch with the things that make children eternally optimistic. And Truffaut was that kind of a person. I saw that when I saw his performance in Wild Child, and I saw that in every movie he ever directed. And so he was my first choice, even though I went to other actors thinking he'd say no. I didn't even call him. I went to a number of actors until I finally got the courage to phone up Francois and ask him if he'd play Monsieur Lacombe. He had a real aspect of, of himself that, that, that was like a child. Everybody in the movie, except some of the more rank-and-file military you know, you know, personnel, I, I went more for the cynic, the kind of life-hardened adult. But most everybody else, we were kids, and we made this picture in the spirit of childhood and believing in things that don't make sense, that only children believe in, because it doesn't have to make sense for a child to deeply believe in something. <laughs> I knew what I wanted to put on screen. I mean, I had very strong images. Maybe I wasn't that good at articulating the images. I'm talking about the nebulous quality of light and how it strikes the optics of a lens and what it does to the lens. It puts these kind of circles around the nodal point of the light. I was describing it that way. You know, I used to park my car, I guess, on the airport boulevard near LAX, and I used to watch all the planes all stacked up out to, in, the, in the sky, you know, coming in one after the other five miles apart. And I used to watch that and say, God, wouldn't that be amazing if I could get that same effect coming into the final zone at the Devil's Tower in Wyoming? And so all the effects guys went out and looked at that, and it turned out great. I didn't know what the mothership would look like, so we tried various things. My first concept was, well, the mothership's just a big pie pan with no lights on it at all, but it blocks out the sky. It just chokes off the ambient light, and I wanted to have some kind of a big shadow just covering everybody as this silent, black, featureless pie pan comes across the landing zone. And then I was in India shooting my last couple of days on Close Encounters, and I kept passing from the hotel in Bombay on the way to Hal. We were shooting about three-hour drive, two-hour drive, and there was this huge refinery out there, and I thought the refinery was amazing. I took some pictures of it. And then later, I, I noticed how beautiful the San Fernando Valley looked with all the lights from Mulholland Drive. And I remember taking these pictures I took of this refinery, which was all these steel cross beams with 50-watt light bulbs everywhere, and saying, well, what if that's the superstructure of the mothership and underneath it is the lights of the San Fernando Valley? I remember giving that concept to Ralph McQuarrie, who painted a conceptual painting of my vision and I don't think I varied more than 5% from what Ralph gave me on paper that day. And I remember Joe Alves gave me a model of Devil's Tower. And Joe found Devil's Tower. He had looked at Shiprock and all the John Ford monuments, you know, in Monument Valley, but it was all too well known to movie audiences. And Joe came back one day and says, I found the place you're looking for. It's called Devil's Tower or De Devil's Post Pile in Wyoming. And he showed me these amazing pictures. And I just said, with all the fluted sides, said, that's it. That's the place. Everything after that was easy. I remember one day with the tape recorder going with Joe in the room and several other people in the room, I pretty much just spitballed the entire ending. What would come first, second, third, all the different movements of the symphony of light and sound and emotion. It was coming to me, it was coming to me so fast that when I got home, I didn't need the tape recorder. I remembered what I had said and I basically, that was the night I, that scene went to paper. It was never on paper until Joe Alves gave me the model miniature of Devil's Tower and the set he was proposing to build. And that's when the whole thing came into focus for me. I remember thinking how much easier Close Encounters was from Jaws because all the sets in Close Encounters didn't roll and pitch.